welcome. Uh, I'm the guy who gets to bring a lot of the bad news this morning. We're going to talk about the economy, uh, and uh, that's not as frightening as it sounds. Um, I, I've titled my presentation this morning, It's the End of the World as We Know It, uh, and I feel fine. So we're going to have some bad news, but we're also going to have uh, some, some uh, good news as we... Uh, as we work through some of this material as well. And, and you know, when we think about what's going on in the world around us, there are some uh, big issues that we're struggling with. We think about uh, inflation. Uh, we think about conflict and war internationally. We think about uh, all the uncertainty around supply chains in, in all of the industries that, uh, that we work in or that thrive in our communities. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about risks like famine that are out there on the horizon as well. So, you know, this is a little depressing in a sense. Uh, and it does feel like we're sort of on the edge of something, right? That there, the world is changing, that there's, there's a moment happening and we're struggling to kind of understand what's going on in the world around us and in the economy around us. Now, you know, I hang my hat at the University of Waterloo a couple of days, so yeah, I have to read a lot of books about this stuff too. Uh, here's some of the stuff that I'll be drawing on this morning, but I promise I read them so you don't have to, right? This is, this is one of those things. Um, there's a lot of really dry stuff out there, but there is interesting uh, idea, there are interesting ideas being talked about and being put forward for example, this fellow named Ray Dalio is the head of the largest hedge fund in the world. He's like one of the biggest investors in the world. He says in his book, uh, The Changing World Order, that we're about to see the collapse of the American empire and the rise of the Chinese empire, that China's about to take over the world. And if you're not quite sure whether that's true or not, he can prove it because he's got a chart, right? <laughs> and if that chart's not particularly convincing, he, he gives a more complex version of the chart later into his book. Uh, and, and as I sort of read through some of these things, I sort of feel like this is where we're ending up with all these ideas, right? Like, what, what's going on? Just because I can draw it, that you know, doesn't help to explain it to me. So I wanted to kind of take a few minutes this morning and talk about what is going on in the economy and maybe draw two or three ideas out of what's happening uh, that could help us understand where our communities are going and the kinds of things that we need to be on top of. So I'm going to talk about the, these three uh, ideas in a little more detail. I'm going to talk about the demographic challenges that we're facing both in Canada and around the world. Demography meaning the kind of the study of how the population is structured. Second, I want to talk about the end of globalization. We've spent the last 20 or 30 years talking about how globalization is changing our community and our economies. This is, this is something that may be ending now. And finally, I'm going to talk about the return of nature uh, and how all of these things are coming together to create a moment of uncertainty for many of us. So what do I mean by uh, the, the, the demographic challenge? Well, it's interesting when we start to look at the way that populations are structured, it tells us a lot about the nature of what's happening in the world. So for example, we've seen over the last year the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this is a, a, a something we've sort of debated and talked about a lot. There's lots of people who have lots of different explanations for why this invasion happened. You know, it's security, insecurity, NATO, Nazis, you know, all this sort of stuff. But one of the questions that I think we don't ask enough is not why did Russia invade Ukraine, but why did Russia invade Ukraine now? Why is this happening over the last 10 or 11 months? And I think that part of the answer comes from a look at Russian demographics, the shape of the Russian population. So this is what's known as a population pyramid. Basically, all your newborns and one-year-olds are down here at the bottom of the pyramid, and all your hundred-year-olds are up at the top. And in a typical society, you have lots of newborns and only a few hundred-year-olds, right? We can see that that typical structure, which looks like a pyramid, doesn't really apply in the case of the Russians. And part of what's happening here is that when we think about men of an age to serve in the military, that's this group here right now. We're sort of on the downside of this blue side of things here. It suggests that uh, if we look five years ahead in terms of the shape of this pyramid, the maximum possible size of the Russian army five years from now is half of what it is today. So if you're going to mount an invasion, you don't have soldiers five years from now. You've got them now, so this is your chance to kind of move in and do things. But there's another side to this story. We've seen that one of the Russian challenges in this war has been the sort of the collapse of logistics, right? They just can't get equipment or, 
or uh, vehicles or people to the right places at the right time. And a lot of the logistics question relies on the, the, the availability of engineering knowledge. How are the road systems structured? How are the train systems structured? Are we able to kind of build the infrastructure to effectively support a military operation? It turns out that, you know, historically, the Soviet Union had a great educational system that was really good at training engineers. But that educational system collapsed in 1989. And so the youngest of the highly trained engineers in the Russian system is now about 56 years old. Right? The average healthy life expectancy of a Russian male is 59.4. So in five years, we don't have the engineers to mount an invasion. So they sort of start to see, as you, look, as you poke away at this demographic question, it starts to explain things that are happening in the world today. Well, what has that got to do with us? Well, there's a sense that the people who study demography sometimes say, demography is destiny. The shape of your population pyramid now influences the kinds of things that are going to happen in your community five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So understanding that demographic reality helps us to understand where our communities are headed. And historically, for most of the last couple of hundred years, population pyramids have looked like this. This is actually the population pyramid for Niger in West Africa. Lots of babies, very few hundred year olds. That's how the whole world looked over the last couple of centuries. But more recently, we're starting to see some things change. This is the population pyramid of Italy. And you can see it's kind of hollowed out at the bottom. It doesn't follow that traditional kind of model. Here's the population pyramid of Germany, showing the same kind of thing. Here's the population pyramid of the European Union as a whole. Not a lot of young people at the base of that pyramid. Here's the population pyramid of China, facing the same kinds of constraints as those countries we've just looked at in, in the European context. And the Chinese demographic structure is particularly important as we start to think about where the economy is going. Because one of the things we're now seeing the signs of is the collapse of the Chinese population. That we are about to enter a period where what was you know, sort of seen as the biggest population nation in the world uh, is going to see a rapid, rapid decline. Uh, some of this has been sort of hidden from us because the Chinese government kind of lies about its demographic information, but that information is now starting to come out. And what we're seeing is that over the course of the next 20, 30, 40 years, the Chinese population will crash. By the end of this century, the population of China will be about half of what it is today. Well, that has really interesting implications for the economy because China has become the world's manufacturing center, right? Everything gets made in China. Well, why does it get made in China? Cheap Chinese labor was the, region that, was the reason that manufacturing went there. The labor was so, you know, so, so low in terms of cost that it made sense to, to make things there and ship them around the world because there was no labor cost to speak of compared to other regions. But if the population is declining in China, then the labor force is shrinking. And if the labor force is shrinking, it's becoming scarce. And economics tells us that means that the cost of that labor is going to go up. It's going to get more expensive. So the whole reason that we have manufacturing centered in China is disappearing over the next 10 or 15 years. And, and part of what happens as a result of this is that this labor scarcity means that we're paying more for that labor. All the manufacturing is there right now. So everything that we make in China is actually getting more expensive. And this is one of the causes of inflation. But the story for China doesn't just stop at that sense that labor is getting more expensive. You know, because not only are they getting more expensive in terms of things they're shipping out around the world, but as they look at ways to kind of restructure their economy, they have no internal market because the population is collapsing. They can't say, oh, well, you know, our things are getting expensive. Let's just sell these goods at home. There's no market at home because the population is going to be half of what it was. And so you end up with this kind of a double whammy sort of suggesting that just at the same time that China becomes uncompetitive internationally, they have no domestic market to start to sell to as well. So here's Canada's population pyramid over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, we can see we start out in the 1950s with a pretty traditional pyramid-shaped kind of a structure. But more and more, we're starting to look like those European countries or those uh, countries in Southeast Asia, like China, where we're hollowed out at the bottom and we've got some real challenges. And I guess one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, 
are, are we caught in the China trap? Are we in the same sort of space as China? And, and we can see signs of what's happening in the broader workforce. So if we look at the sort of participation rate in our workforce, it is declining. We're seeing sort of increasing constraints and challenges around the availability of labor as, in, in a sense, our workforce begins to shrink, that there are fewer and fewer workers available because we just don't have the young people to sort of come in at the bottom of this pyramid. And we can actually trace the data and show that since about 2003, uh, what effectively measures the size of our workforce has been declining. So for 20 years now, our workforce has been shrinking in much the same way we talked about in the Chinese context. Now, after the pandemic, it's become kind of, kind of trendy to say, well, you know, we gave out a lot of money during the pandemic, right? There's lots of people who are just staying at home because they got government handouts. That's what the real problem is. The data doesn't show this. What it shows is that for those between 25 and 54 years of age, their participation in the workforce and the number of them in the workforce has actually grown since the start of the pandemic. And the same is true for 15 to 24 year olds. So everybody under the age of 54 is participating in higher and higher levels in the workforce and in the economy. Where the collapse is happening is in those 55 and older. Why? Because they're retiring. They're leaving the workforce. And the, the aging section of our population, of our demography, is so much larger than the young section that the workforce is shrinking. It's not that we're getting lazy and staying home with government handouts. It's that the people just aren't there to fill those jobs. And this is creating all kinds of challenges. This chart kind of shows um, different sectors of the economy uh, and what's happening in terms of the number of people working in those industries. And when labor becomes scarce, People have the opportunity to move around. They can shop for the right kind of job. And we're seeing some sectors of the economy that as a result are losing massive numbers of employees. The accommodation and food services sector here at the bottom of the screen has lost almost 15% of the total workforce. Why? Because jobs in that sector typically don't pay a lot. So people are leaving that sector to go work in another sector where they get paid a lot more. So we can see, for example, finance, insurance, real estate, up about the same amount as, uh, as accommodations and food services have declined. There's this reorienting of the workforce because people are getting smart. They're saying, uh, this isn't a great job. It doesn't pay as much as I want. It doesn't give me a lot of stability. I'm going to go find something that works better for me. And so we're seeing this kind of upheaval created in the workforce. And part of what happens when that takes place is that wages rise. And over the last two years, we have seen wages rise in every sector of the Canadian economy, with the exception of mining. Mining stayed about flat. Every other sector has risen. Why? Because we're trying to find workers. Employers are offering more money to try to recruit workers into these jobs. And we just don't have those workers available. So as I say, is this a sign that we're in the same trap as China? that we're going to sort of struggle with this loss of international markets and this collapse of our internal market. And so we've got some real problems to try to confront. I think maybe we're not on the same path, that there may be a little bit of a different story in the context of Canada. For one thing, we're part of a North American free trade region. And when we look at the demographics of North America, we see a different kind of a story, that the US population pyramid is a little healthier uh, than many of the ones that we've looked at, including, including the Canadian population pyramid. And the Mexican population pyramid actually looks really good. So we sit in the center of a, 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 a tri-national marketplace that's actually in a fairly good demographic position. And so that gives us some hope that our markets will continue to grow and expand and that they won't disappear the way that some of the Chinese markets may. Uh, at the same time, Canada has become the most pro-immigration country in the history of the world. So how are we filling that gap of missing workers? We're saying, let's start to bring in more immigrants to, to sort of fill the space uh, that, that our current population doesn't come into. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, Canada, we've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. We're now starting to see signs that other countries around the world are trying to emulate and copy the approach that Canada has taken. Australia, Germany, the UK, Japan, they are all sort of modeling their immigration policies on the structure of what Canada has done. And, you know, here at home, we've essentially doubled down on this notion that we're now going to try to bring in 
1.5 million immigrants over the next three years as a way of kind of addressing this huge demographic challenge. If we can't, if we're not having babies and growing our own population here at home, let's bring in some people from other places that can kind of fill that gap and begin to sort of fill elements of the workplace. It's an interesting strategy, brings with it a whole series of other challenges. If we have 1.5 million new Canadians over the next three years, where are they gonna live? We're already struggling with things like housing affordability, right? So, so this starts to kind of raise some real challenges, but it suggests that demographically, Canada may be in a little bit of a different position than some of those company, con uh, countries that are really gonna suffer uh, in this process. The, the second thing I think that's out there that's sort of changing how our economies work is this notion of the end of globalization. As I said earlier, you know, we've spent a lot of time over the last 20 years or so talking about globalization and how we need to be on top of this, right? We have to be expanding our global markets. We have to be ready for all these opportunities. The reality is we may be moving in a slightly different direction. Global trade actually peaked in 2008 and has been declining since. The level of global trade today is lower than it was a decade and a half ago. And, and this is reflecting a number of things that are going on in the international economy. But part of this is what's sometimes referred to as the decline of the global order. Well, what's the global order? After World War II, the US government essentially said, we're gonna set up a series of institutions and rules about how the economy and, and international relations is gonna work. And so they created the United Nations and the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and all these things. And all of these structures were backed by US money and US military power. And they basically said, we're gonna help sort of govern the world. Well, the reality is that the US is no longer interested in playing that role that they are retreating from many of those international roles and responsibilities. They're not interested in supporting those institutions the way they once were. There are fewer soldiers, American soldiers today in the Middle East than there have been at any point since 1945. Right? This is the sign that the US is withdrawing from this global role and heading home again. They're inwardly focused rather than outwardly focused. Uh, and this starts to sort of create some interesting situations out there that create real challenges for businesses and the economy. We see, as a result, increasing levels of international conflict. We've talked about the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. We've also seen sort of conflict uh, on the border between India and China, between Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. We've seen uh, uh, ramping up fighting in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. There's this sense that, you know, in the absence of the global order, we will start to see more conflict, and we've already seen the earliest signs of that. We'll also start to see the reemergence of things like piracy. This isn't something from the 1700s. We're now sort of seeing this as an increasing reality that in places like the South China Sea, the Horn of Africa, the Red Sea, there are real dangers to international shipping because of the return of piracy. We see things like sabotage. Governments now engaging directly in the sabotage of infrastructure or economic operations. The Russians blowing up pipelines in the North Sea. Uh, the Iranians trying to blow up Israeli oil tankers in the Straits of Hormuz. There's this sense that governments are now quite willing to sort of not follow the rules and start to do these kinds of things. And bad driving, well, this is part of the equation as well, right? So we think about all of these global supply chains that we've built up over the last few years and how all of these things start to kind of change uh, the reliability of those supply chains. When we have war, when we have piracy, when we have sabotage, when we have sort of accidents that we can't quite get together to sort of solve, this creates challenges for supply chains. And every company that relies on these global supply chains becomes at risk to all of these things that could impact any little piece of the supply chain along the route. One great example, Think about uh, the road construction project. We always say we have two seasons in Ontario, right? There's, there's sort of summer, winter and, and, and road work. Um, we, you might have noticed this past summer that many of our road work projects seem to be taking longer than ever. Part of that is that the steel for the rebar used in most of the highway construction in Ontario was actually manufactured at the Azov steel plant in the Ukraine, which of course was destroyed by the Russians last summer. So suddenly, the fact that there's a war over in Ukraine 
erodes our ability to build highways here in Ontario or to build them in a timely way. That's an example of how the sort of the supply chain question is really starting to sort of be um, uh, exposed by all of these international processes. And when we think about some of the industries that we have in Ontario, the car that we manufacture in Ontario, for example, uh, a sort of gasoline powered car has 30,000 components. And those 30,000 components come from all around the world. And suddenly as our supply chain supply chains become vulnerable, our ability to manufacture those cars is challenged in interesting ways. And nowhere is this perhaps likely to be more problematic than in the energy sector itself. Certainly when we look at oil and gas to a lesser extent at coal, there are huge challenges in terms of how we extract these resources and transport them around the world. First, they come from some of the most unstable places in the world, Saudi Arabia and Iran and places like this. But then we also rely on these international supply chains to get that energy to where it's needed. And our sense is that because of this supply chain challenge, these markets are gonna be disrupted quite frequently over the next 10 to 20 years, meaning that the entire oil and gas sector is going to be a bit of a roller coaster. And those that rely on traditional carbon-based sources of energy are going to be at the mercy of some of these supply chain uh, issues. This is part of why I think the, the outlook or the future for the nuclear industry is, is so bullish, right? If we sort of look at this as uh, projections from Bloomberg from November, this is the growth of the nuclear industry over the next 20 years or so. There's this sense that in the midst of chaos in the supply chains for traditional energy sectors, we see immense new opportunities in a sector that this community is really well positioned for. So when we think about all of this, there are some interesting impacts to deglobalization. First, this increased instability makes trade more difficult. And as a result, our supply chains, as I've described, are stretched and challenged. A rising energy costs make those supply chains, even where they're safe, makes them uh, more expensive uh, to maintain and to operate. And businesses that are dependent on these supply chains see more vulnerability and increased risks. It means things like their insurance costs start to go up as well. So as a result of this, the cost of all goods, of everything that we build or make or manufacture starts to rise. And so does inflation. And the final force that I think is really reshaping our, our understanding of where the economy is going over the next 10 years or so is this notion of the return of nature. You know, for the last 500 years, the story of our economy, the story of our communities has in some sense been this notion of, of pushing against the boundaries of nature. That we have traveled out around the world and conquered and colonized most of the spaces that we have found and we have pushed back the edges of nature. We have torn down the forests to make for farms. We have torn out the farms to make cities. And there's this sense that we have pushed against the edges of nature, but in the last few years, we have started to see nature push back. And it's pushed back in a number of ways. The first, and maybe the most obvious, is through the pandemic that we've seen recently. You know, COVID-19 is what's known as a zoonotic disease. The reservoir of this disease lay with a species of animal and we were exposed to it because we moved into the habitat of that animal. And we can sort of see that with the massive population levels in Southeast Asia over the last 20 or 30 years, that there have been a series of zoonotic diseases that have come out of this sort of environmental pressures of that region to cause pandemics of a global nature. We've seen this with COVID-19, we've seen it with SARS, we've seen it with avian flu, we've seen it with swine flu. Uh, and, and the reality is that as the population of Southeast Asia crashes, we will not see this influence coming out of Southeast Asia anymore, but we may start to see it coming out of West Africa. I showed the population pyramid of Niger earlier. By the end of this century, the population of West Africa could be 1.4 billion people. And as a result, we're pushing into wild spaces in West Africa that are also a reservoir for zoonotic diseases. And so when we think about things like monkeypox or Ebola or HIV AIDS, these are diseases that have come out of those zoonotic reservoirs in West Africa, and we may see more of those kind of challenges in the future. What does that have to do with the economy? Well, there was some interesting research done uh, during the pandemic to sort of show that if we look at all of the plagues and pandemics in the last thousand years, every single one of them has been followed by a period of rising labor costs and inflation. Every single one. 
one of the natural results of plagues and pandemics is inflation. And so this tells us that if we're, if we're likely to continue to see some of these medical challenges in the future, that we may continue to see some of these inflation pressures as well. But perhaps the biggest sort of pushback from nature that we're starting to see the impacts of is in the field of climate change. And we now have enough of an understanding of some of the processes underway that we can start to figure out the local impacts of certain aspects of a, of a, of a, a warming planet. So this map here, for example, shows the United States and the agricultural yield that we could expect in different regions of the states because of the impacts of global warming. And it's clear that global warming will affect some communities in positive ways, from an agricultural perspective at least, but it will affect other communities in negative ways. And one of the things we have to start to figure out is that as the implications of global warming start to play out at the local level, are our communities going to benefit from some of what's happening? Or are they going to suffer? Or is it going to be a sort of a mix here? And how is that going to reshape our economies? Because one of the challenges that comes with global warming is its impact on the agri-food sector in particular. As climate patterns shift, so do food production patterns. And although some regions might benefit from this and grow more food, most regions, many more regions, will suffer and we will be growing less food. The global level of food production will fall over the next 10 or 20 years. Food prices will rise. We're certainly seeing that already. And as food prices rise, so does inflation. But rising food prices sort of get impacted in a number of different ways because when we think about the inputs to the agricultural sector, things like fertilizers, they are made primarily from petroleum products. So if the energy sector is at risk, uh, then, then what's that mean for the agri-food sector? And as these forces start to come together, we're starting to imagine a world in which food becomes much more scarce than it is today and much more expensive than it is today. Now, agriculturally, this, does, this has a couple of effects. Certainly for agricultural industries, we'll see some shakeouts. So for example, if we look at the cotton industry, we can look at the 10 largest producers of cotton in the world. Two of those, three of those uh, regions will be wiped off the map through global warming. The Chinese and Australian cotton industries will likely disappear because a rising temperature means those places will be too dry to grow cotton. The, uh, the Central Asian cotton region relies on an irrigation system that was put in place by the Soviets in the 1950s. That irrigation system is fed by a glacier in the mountains of the region. That glacier will be completely gone by the end of this decade, meaning there's no water to maintain that cotton industry. So we will wipe sort of half the cotton players in the world off the map in the next couple of years, which has all kinds of implications for industries like textiles and clothing and fashion. What happens when climate change disrupts our ability to engage in the traditional industries that we've looked at? But food is where this becomes particularly important, that many regions of the world, because of warmer and drier climates, will not be able to grow as much food as they have historically and will not be able to grow enough food to feed their populations. So anything in red, orange, yellow on this map suggests a region where they will have high levels of food insecurity, where they won't have enough food to feed their own people. And I think right off the bat, we can see that one of those countries is China, right? So not only the other challenges that we've talked about, but this increasing sense of food insecurity, or over the next decade or two, the deficit of food uh, in terms of the Chinese agricultural sector will become massive, that China will not be able to feed itself, and that this will kind of throw another monkey wrench into the current structure of the international economy. So what happens? Demographic forces, deglobalization, supply chain challenges, food insecurity, food shortages, that all of this starts to drive inflation in ways that we're feeling at the local level. So this chart here shows uh, current inflation levels in, in, in Canada. The dark blue line is where our inflation rate is at the moment. We can see these two blue lines represent food and energy as the costs driving inflation. So we can see when I talk about food and energy and the sort of problems that we're facing, that's what's driving this inflation crisis that we're facing at the moment. And as we sort of look at that, you know, in some sense, Canada is doing 
better than many others when it comes to this set of challenges. That we have some, we're insulated to some degree from some of these issues, but that there's no way of escaping this because it's a bit of a global phenomenon or a global process. And even as we sort of project where we go in the future, Canada may actually be better off than many other places on the inflation front, but we're sort of seeing challenges that will continue for a number of years on the inflation side. So what does all this mean? Why is this relevant to, to any of you that are gathered here other than kind of frightening you early on a Friday morning? <laughs> um, first, a very technical lesson out of all of this, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> China, China's not looking very good in this situation, right? China's screwed in some, some interesting ways. Um, and we already see uh, some interesting sign of signs of stress in China. If we follow the headlines, if we kind of follow the news, we see this notion that, that China is really kind of struggling to contain all of the impacts of the things that we've talked about today. Uh, and there's nothing like, you know, sort of going after somebody while they're down, but the US is certainly trying to take advantage of this moment. So we've seen over the last year or so in the telecommunications space, for example, the US going after telecom companies like Huawei to sort of say, oh, the, the market's hurting, the economy in China's hurting, Let, let's push those players out of that market. And so the conflict between, you know, different countries on the telecom side was sort of an early side of this. More recently, we've seen the US ban the production of, effectively ban the production of semiconductors in the computer industry in China, which is another sort of play in this game. Let's take more opportunities away from the Chinese. Most recently, we've sort of seen a decision by the US government not to allow the Chinese to have a major role in aircraft production and sort of push them out of that particular industry too. And this is a sort of a sign of why this starts to become relevant to us. Because as the Chinese are being pushed out of an industry like aircraft manufacturing, it opens up opportunities for us closer to home. So Calgary or Calgary region just sort of announced a major investment in a new aircraft production facility, specifically because that opportunity had been taken away from the Chinese. And so as China suffers, we don't want to necessarily relish in the suffering of other people, but it does suggest there will be an emerging set of opportunities closer to home that we haven't really thought about yet. And as a result, we can start to say that, you know, despite all of this bad news, Canada may be in a relatively good spot as we start to look forward. Really? Like, what, what is this? So, so demographically, as we said, the North American marketplace that we're a part of is in pretty good shape. Uh, and that as we sort of deglobalize, we're likely to see these regional markets become more and more important. And we're in a good regional market based on the North American marketplace. Our supply chains, if they're within North America, have relatively limited risk. We don't have to worry about pirates and wars if we're, if we're operating primarily in, inside North America. Uh, our region uh, is beginning to achieve energy independence in part through the rise of things like fracking in the States and in part through the growth of green energy alternatives, including nuclear. Uh, and our strong health systems mean that we face less risk on the zoonotic disease front than many other regions of the world do. Climate will be a challenge, but in some sense, you know, our region may be better positioned than many others, particularly when it comes to the agri-food sector, to, to, to survive the challenges of climate in some interesting ways. So what are the, the sort of lessons that we can start to take away from some of these ideas? Um, the growing population in North America means we will continue to have growing regional markets. So we aren't going to lose all the markets for our goods and services. Second, the agri-food sector is likely to grow very dramatically sort of moving forward. Many of our communities in this region are sort of dependent on agri-food or, or see it as a sort of a major pillar of the economy. While the inputs and costs of operating agricultural operations will rise, food prices will rise faster, which is probably good news for the bottom line of many agricultural operations. The domestic energy sector must find ways to grow rapidly. Uh, and to grow cleanly, given the challenges of climate change. And the decline of global trade means the reshoring of manufacturing. That over the next 20 years, we will see more investment in the manufacturing sector in Ontario than we have seen over the last century. The amount of investment coming back to Canada, back to North America, will be staggering. And so one of the things our communities need to, need to be focused on is how do we prepare for that wave of investment? How do we ensure that it's looking at our communities if we want to attract that kind of investment? And how do we ensure that we're ready to accept or absorb that kind of activity? There are other implications as well. In the workforce, for example, if workers 
in a post-pandemic environment have the bargaining power. Wage expenses will continue to rise. That's good news for workers in the sense that we can earn more money for the work that we do. It's bad news for employers to some extent. Uh, but one of, the re one of the, the, sort of the implications of this is that we will start to see higher levels of automation that in every industry of workers are scarce and expensive, we will look for ways to kind of automate activities. That includes things like farming, as well as it includes things like manufacturing. Secondly, at a, at a practical level for many businesses, we, we've just sort of imagined that supply chains function for the last 20 or 30 years, right? We haven't had to spend a lot of time or energy thinking about the challenges to supply chains at a global level. That's all changing. Increased risks, and delays mean that every company, even the small ones in our communities, have to be thinking about supply chain all the time. It means we're going to have to sort of increase the number of suppliers that we draw on at the, the level of the local company, that we will have to try to start embedding ourselves in local and regional supply chain networks rather than global networks, and we'll start to favor reliability over price. This is another blow to China in the sense that why have we had China as the bedrock of our supply chains? Because it was cheap. Now cheap doesn't matter. If it's cheap and I can't get it, it's not going to help me. I got to I got to find something that's reliable rather than cheap. And this will play out differently in different industries. If I'm an automotive manufacturer and I can't get a part for my car for three months, it delays my production cycle or my sales cycle. If I'm in agriculture and I can't get something for three months, I miss the season. I can't plant the crop or I can't harvest it or I don't have the right inputs at the right time. And so every industry will kind of have to wrestle through this a little bit differently. But supply chain becomes a big and challenging consideration. And part of how we've structured our supply chains in southern Ontario in recent years is this notion of just in time. That we've had a massive kind of trucking industry infrastructure that makes sure that things are delivered to our plants or our operations or our stores just as they're needed. And we really won't be able to do that much anymore. We'll have to start to think about things like inventory management more. We'll have to have shorter, more deep uh, supply chains. We'll have to kind of have less dispersed supply chains, things that exist rather at the local level. And we're likely to see an increased use of warehousing and aggregation facilities. So those industrial parks in our communities, this needs to be one of the areas where we're looking at how we develop the facilities that will support local supply chains rather than global supply chains. But all of this, all of these changes continue to kind of deepen and contribute to the inflation challenge that we're facing. That all of these factors continue to kind of raise the prices of the goods and services that we draw on. And so I think there's some things that we can do to sort of cope with that aspect of what's happening. So I know there's a number of economic developers in the room today, some ideas in terms of your work. As you're working with businesses in your communities, you're going to start to see that they are less able to draw on credit, particularly with rising interest rates, and that we need to kind of encourage them to the development of greater cash reserves. And that's something that's really easy to say, very difficult to do, but it's a return to the kind of business operations that our parents and grandparents had in place a generation or two ago. Less credit, more cash. That as we seek to kind of expand operations, we will see less use of loans and more use of tools like lines of credit. And so could we be working with local structures, community futures organizations or things like that to sort of say, how do we develop more tools that are more flexible to support the needs of local businesses facing this inflation crunch. I think we'll see the emergence of barter structures. Rather than buying and selling between local industries, can we trade goods and services as a way of bypassing some of the financial challenges? And we'll see more peer-to-peer -peer lending structures. How can a group of small businesses lend resources to support the development of another small business in the community? How can wealthier individuals in the community support the startup uh, environment that might be emerging. And if these structures aren't in place, part of the role of the economic developer becomes to say, hey, how do we encourage these things to emerge? Similarly, I think we're likely to see the re-emergence of cooperatives as a big factor in the development of local economies. We have some co-ops in place, but we don't have as many again as we might have had a generation or two ago. And so seeing these cooperatives emerge as a way to pool resources and bypass some of the formal structures of the traditional banking or financial systems may be a kind of a way to strengthen our local economies. Uh, if you're an elected official, maybe with a municipal council or a band council, 
I think there's some things that you can be thinking about as well in this space, that we're entering a kind of an inflationary period. We're seeing rising wages, a rising cost of living, uh, and rising immigration levels, which may push housing prices uh, in even higher directions. And so there's some interesting sort of structural challenges in terms of how you plan for the community that you're working with. And I think that this sort of suggests that some of the areas we need to be focused on from a local government perspective include things like workforce development. We've often sort of said, oh, that's more a provincial thing to, to worry about. We need to be stressing that in terms of what we do locally. We need to be focused on affordable housing. If we already have labor shortages, well, the feds have sort of set up a system of 1.5 million new immigrants. That's meant to address that question, but how do we get them here and how do we house them once they get here? Can we house them? Uh, and we need to be thinking about infrastructure development. If we are reshoring manufacturing, if we are localizing supply chains, do we have the infrastructure to support that? Are our industrial parks and our road systems and our bridges ready for these kinds of changes that we're likely to see? And finally, for those of you here in the nuclear industry, maybe some, some thoughts about the implications of some of these ideas for your industry. Um, there are some risks in the collapse of these global systems for this industry in particular. Uh, we are going to enter a period of increased energy and climate insecurity. I think in some ways that can be positive news uh, for the nuclear industry. Uh, but the supply chain challenges that we, we've talked about uh, are relevant to every industry. And so understanding where the risks are in your supply chain will be critical. For some regions, it's as simple as where are we going to get the uranium? I don't think that'll be an issue for us. I don't think that'll be an issue for the big players like the US or, or France or or Russia in this space, but for many middle players, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, for example, we will start to see real challenges in terms of accessing some of the most basic supplies to, to sustain the nuclear industry. We'll also see a shortage of workers in the nuclear industry and increased international competition for really highly skilled and highly qualified workers. We already know that France is targeting Canada as they look to ramp up their nuclear industry. They're looking to poach and steal as much talent from Canada as they can. And so understanding that this is coming and preparing for that are gonna be important. But even though there are risks in this industry, I think there are some pretty significant opportunities. Uh, and these are opportunities that are relevant, not just to say Bruce Power, but to the communities that are gathered here today as well. That we will see an increased demand, particularly for clean and green energies, for wind, for solar, for nuclear, because we are going to have these disrupted supply chains for oil and gas and coal and all of these traditional sources of fuel. So the demand for what you're producing here will rise. We'll also see a whole series of spin-off opportunities. We know that there have been spin-off opportunities in the nuclear sector for years, things like small modular reactors or medical isotopes. The reshoring and the localizing of manufacturing means that those opportunities will likely accrue to the communities within this region or immediately surrounding this region rather than part of a global system where they might end up in Europe or in Asia or something like that. That the opportunities that we see in the tremendous growth of this sector represent real opportunities for communities in this part of the world and in this particular region. So <laughs> it does feel like we're kind of on the edge of some big stuff, right? As I say, war, famine, inflation, supply chain collapse, these are some scary issues. We are entering a really difficult time as we try to understand where the economy is going and what we can do at the local level. And one of the questions I often get asked is sort of, well, uh, how long is all this bad stuff going to last? How long do we have to deal with this? You know, like fourth quarter, are we okay? <laughs> um, you know, my guess is when we look at those demographic pyramids, this suggests that uh, we've, we've got about 10 or 12 years of real uncertainty ahead of us, right? So yes, I hope that inflation starts to come under a little more control. We've seen it decline a little bit, uh, 6.5 in the US yesterday. Um, you know, there's this sense that some of the things are headed in the right direction, but we've really got about a decade or a little more of uncertainty ahead of us, that we will struggle with these issues for the next few years, that this is not something that's going to resolve itself quickly or overnight. And so we need to be aware of and thinking about these kinds of issues. But despite those dangers, despite the challenges that sit with us, you know, Despite the reality that this is the end of the world as we know it, <laughs> the end of the world that we grew up in and that we've existed in for the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, it's the end of that world, but it's not the end of everything. It's the end of the world as we know it, 
and I feel fine. I'm a child of the 80s, right? This is REM, this is singing in my head right now. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. There are amazing opportunities ahead of our communities. There are things that we can be doing. There are things that we can be pursuing to help grow a, a new kind of community that sort of sits well in this changing future. A, a series of opportunities that speak to a more equitable economic future for our communities, and one that provides opportunities for everyone. There are some challenges that come with that, but the opportunities are greater. And so it is the end of the world as we know it, but I feel fine. If we've got some time, I'd be happy to take a few questions at this point. Thank you. That was a real build up to me asking this question. <laughs> um, thanks, Brock. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, you touched on it a little bit in relation to automation. It seems like what you've shared with us is an accelerant towards increased automation, robotics, the use of AI, chat CPT or whatever it is. Um, curious about how that factors into this, this future projection. And maybe it's not clear yet, but I was curious how it might factor in. Yeah, how to answer a complex question in a minute or less, right? It's a, um, so yeah, I do see an acceleration of automation and I think um, it will play out differently in different communities depending on the kinds of industries that are there. Uh, I think in this region, for example, with a strong agricultural presence, we're likely to see the, the sort of the advent of more precision farming tools. Um, which will sort of, sort of reorient the way that agricultural operations work. This is the sense that we can increase our reliance on inputs or, or, or other cost factors by using emerging technologies to kind of increase the productivity of our farms while decreasing the operation costs. We, we will likely see similar kinds of things play out in a range of industries, but exactly when and how they start to arise will differ from industry to industry. We've, we've often struggled with the challenge in Canada that we have lower levels of productivity than uh, many other sort of uh, developed nations, so the US in particular. And, and part of it is that we have been slower to embrace automation than some of those other jurisdictions. So there's a part of this that is sort of catching up to what we already see in other places, but there's a part of this that is introducing tools in sectors where they haven't been used a whole lot. And in, in my mind, um, the advent of these technologies isn't really about eliminating jobs. We've already got a labor shortage. It's about filling the gaps of, of, of where we can't find the workers right now. But it does suggest that the skill sets that workers will have to have five or 10 or 15 years from now are very different than the kinds of skill sets that they have to have now. That uh, the ability to kind of work alongside these emerging automated or technological tools is going to be sort of more important. And it's not something that's traditionally been embedded into many of our educational systems. I think colleges have been better at this than say the, the school system or the university system, but there's this sense that we need to sort of reorient some of our workforce development initiatives. Uh, and I think part of, part of what will also sort of play out in this space is, is as we start to use more automated tools, all of those tools will be developing more data uh, and that that data will then become uh, available to sort of feed processes like predictive analysis, the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And, and for most of us, that's not an issue we've ever really considered applying to our industries before. And so there's this kind of big unknown out there. What, what does artificial intelligence mean in the context of agriculture? What does predictive analysis mean in the context of the nuclear industry? We have some ideas, but this is an area that's a bit of an unknown for us. And so as we think about the things we need to prepare for over the next few years, that's one of the big questions in my mind. You spoke... You spoke briefly of the uh, decline of the American influence on global order, political and uh, military. Do you see the same effect happening as far as economic uh, influence? Because that might play a bigger role in Canada's uh, growth or decline than even the Chinese uh, predicament. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So I. I don't necessarily see a decline in American economic power. Um, 
but a sort of a retrenching, uh, that America might be less concerned about maintaining a global economy and more concerned about con maintaining a sort of a, a, a regional economy. Um, and I think, you know, this is part of why I suggest that Canada is in a relatively good spot, but I do really worry about Europe, for example, because much of the European economy has been sort of founded on this notion of, of strong links to the American economy. Um, and so, I, you know, as I sort of look across the European markets, I think France is in a relatively good position, but, but Germany's in a terrible spot moving forward. And a lot of Central Europe is sort of this post-Soviet uh, Eastern Europe uh, is also in a very challenging position. And so if the markets for the goods and services that we have uh, uh, have traditionally been into those European marketplaces, I think the retrenching of America sort of creates problems for us in, in terms of continuing to service those international markets. But if our markets are primarily focused on the US or even Latin America, then we may likely be in an even more positive position. So, so I think in a sense, it's, um, it's not a decline of American economic power, it's a decline of where they're likely to want to exert the influence that comes with that power. They're just less interested in kind of being the world's policeman uh, and, more, and more interested in kind of staying home and making sure that things are running smoothly. Maybe we'll have one more question, if that's okay. Um, I know, I'm, I apologize, I see a few hands up. Um, Brock, I believe, is sticking around for the entire day. So just to stick with our program, uh, we'll do one more question, and thanks very much. Thanks, Brock, that was, that was great. Uh, Thank you. So Brock, one of the things I've been saying within the region is that we need to be investment ready. And I see a, an a uptake and utilization of our industrial parks. And so I think we need to be thinking future and be, be looking at getting more investment ready and having more industrial parks and more land available and actually municipally owned. And, uh, and, I, and not just 10 acres. I think we need to be thinking bigger. Just wondered what your perspective of, because you touch and talk to a lot of different municipalities across Ontario. Who is doing a good job at this and who isn't uh, would be my question. Yeah, and I, I, it's an interesting question. Uh, when we think about uh, the industrial parks, we all, you know, when, when a company comes to our region and we're likely to see more of those with this reshoring and manufacturing, um, there's some basic things they need. They need the infrastructure to be able to operate in. They need land, serviced land, ideally, to put a, to put a facility on. It needs to be shovel ready to some extent. And I think over the last 30 or 40 years, we've moved away from the notion that local government has a big role in kind of ensuring that that's in place. And we need to return to the notion uh, that, that local government is key to sort of ensuring that that infrastructure, that those opportunities are in place. Who, who's doing this well across the country? I, I am gonna point outside of Ontario, but I would point to the city of Moncton in New Brunswick. Um, they have a series of industrial parks uh, that have continued to be filled and they've had the, their struggle is finding new lands to create new industrial parks because they've been growing and filling up so rapidly. And I think there's some really interesting models to kind of learn from them. But they've also kind of signposted some of the challenges that local government is gonna to have to deal with in terms of the opportunities coming to those industrial parks. And for example, a company that recently located to, to Moncton uh, in one of their parks was uh, PPG, the uh, international paint and coatings company. They created a new 70,000 square foot facility in one of Munkin's industrial parks. Uh, it is a dark facility. It is completely automated. It has six employees. And so traditionally in economic development, when we attracted investment, it gave great tax revenues to our municipalities and it created lots of jobs in the community. And this was wonderful because everybody sort of won in the economic development space. This PPG plant in Moncton sort of shows how those things have become separated. I can have a 70,000 square foot plant with no employees and it's great from a tax revenue perspective, but it's terrible from an employment creation or local, local economic activity perspective. So what, what is my priority in the economic development space? And I think we've got to start to wrestle with a few more of these questions. If we are successful in developing more facilities, more spaces to put in place like industrial parks in our communities, what kinds of industries do we want to have there? I think we, we've often sort of been open to taking just about anything. We need to be much more selective and much more strategic about what we might allow into these uh, parks in the future as we think about our specific goals and objectives in the economic development space. It's great if it can provide tax revenue and employment or and economic activity, but if we have to choose between one and the other, what's our strategy and what's our preference? And have we really thought through the implications of some of what's happening? Hope that helps. Thank you.